What do they got in there, King Kong? I was very impressed with Bob Gurr and his creation at Universal Studios with King Kong, which basically is like a big inflatable balloon that moves with wonderful smoothness. You can actually see muscle tone moving underneath the fur. And I was very impressed with that. And so Bob Gurr and I had some initial conversations about making some of the dinosaurs uh, full size. As a matter of fact, I initially wanted to make all the dinosaurs full size, and that, of course, was just my wishful thinking. But that didn't work out. We were going to break some new ground, but it was going to be costly new ground. Uh, the next idea I had was to go to the great physical effects maestros in town. Spielberg assembled Hollywood's top special effects talent for a unique collaboration. Stan Winston, Phil Tippett, Dennis Muren, and Michael Lantieri would compose Jurassic's design team. I remember a conversation simply uh, on the line of, would we be interested? And it was like, <laughs> be interested, my goodness. The initial approach for Jurassic's dinosaurs relied on traditional technology, combining movable miniatures created by Phil Tippett with a few full-size robotic creatures designed by Stan Winston. Michael Lantieri would supervise the interaction of these elements with the actors in the set. And Dennis Muren would lead the team at Industrial Light and Magic in combining the elements on film and post-production. By 1991, work was underway at Stan Winston's studio. The first step was to determine the look of each character. The artistry of getting these dinosaurs to look real is absolutely the most important first step. If they didn't look real, if you didn't believe their skin, their flesh, their reality, their details, their eyes, their teeth, their mouth, everything about them, no matter how good the performances were, they wouldn't be real. Because you'd have something acting real, but it didn't look real. So real. I think it's my kids time. are going to love to come to the set until they yeah. see this guy, <laughs> and then they're going to want to go home. The reactions from Steven Spielberg, from Michael Crichton, from anyone who would walk in and see the process was always excitement. You get jazzed, you get high, you go, whoa, it's really coming alive. As the sculpture is finished, the molds are taken from that, and from those molds, the skins are made. Those then go on to the robotics and animatronics that have been built in a parallel process. So you have the robotics, which are your skeletal structure and muscles, and then your skins, which are pulled from the molds that go over those animatronic and robotics of these dinosaurs. So that's why this is such a perfect combination of art and technology. It soon became important to decide how the dinosaurs would be required to move on screen. Phil Tippett wanted to actually do storyboards three-dimensionally with little clay uh, um, uh, figures of dinosaurs and people that would completely imitate my storyboards, but flesh out my storyboards and give them dimension. These temporary sequences were known as animatics. Storyboards don't show you any of the, the temporal cadence, the sequence, the timing of it. And uh, the animatics allowed us to, to block out the entire you know, sequence so that Stephen on the set would have this, this template that he could use to show the actors this is the way it's going to look. Steven's direction from, from the very first day was that, you know, he knew that there were, you know, things with big pointy, you know, teeth chasing, you know, chasing people and trying to eat them, that he had a monster movie on his hands. I mean, that was, that was a given. But he didn't want to have these things portrayed as, as monsters. He wanted to bring them back down to a naturalistic level, and, you know, he wanted them portrayed as animals. So we spent a great deal of time, you know, working with the paleontologists and um, doing a lot of field work. To help portray scientifically accurate behavior, filmmakers enlisted the help of paleontologist Jack Horner, one of the world's leading dinosaur experts. Horner's research has been instrumental in changing our view of dinosaurs. He contends that birds, not reptiles, represent their closest living link. For Jurassic's design team, maintaining scientific accuracy would mean breaking the reptilian stereotypes associated with dinosaurs. 
whole idea is to get people to look at dinosaurs more like birds than as reptiles. And one of the scenes, some of the uh, model makers had made a tongue come out, like a lizard or a snake. I came up with this routine for the raptors, where they they were you know genetic you know mutations to a degree. So I thought you know we'll have the the raptor stick out his tongue, and Horner saw the animatics of that, and so, you know just came down on us like a ton of bricks and said, "Who stupid idea was that?" And I go, "Mine, sir." And he said, "You, no, they could never do that." We know that they didn't do that. So, had that been left in the scene, all the work into making these things bird-like would have been gone. Once the characteristics of Jurassic's dinosaurs had been settled, it was time to put them to the test and see how they looked in motion. At this stage, the plan called for all wide shots to be done with Phil Tippett's go motion technique, a modern extension of traditional stop motion animation. But Phil Tippett had perfected the motion blur, which gave go motion a closer resemblance to real life. But it wasn't 100%. It was still jerky. And Phil did a whole bunch of wonderful blur motions on a T-Rex running, on a raptor running. I come home with my kids and look at this stuff over and over and over again. And my kids bought it. They said, wow, Dad, a real dinosaur. But I still saw the jerk. The movement was very accurate and very rhythmical, but there was still something a bit go-motion-y about it. And, and that's when Dennis Murin came to me with this idea to show me a test. But it seemed like if you did that work as good as you could possibly do, it wouldn't be up to the quality of, of, of I think, what the audiences today expect and deserve and what we're capable of giving them. So we sort of began a little experimenting to see how far the computer technology had taken us during Terminator, if we could go up to another level. Did you ever consider letting us do most of the full-size dinosaurs uh, from head to toe on the computer? And my first reaction was, well, prove it. And he went out and he proved it. There's a number of things that we had to solve at the start of the show if we were going to if we were going to risk what we were going to risk because it was pretty difficult. We didn't know if we could do it, if it was going to be a disaster or whatever. And there was a lot of debate because we never made living creatures. We'd done a lot of sort of stylized things like creatures of the water or made out of this liquid metal like in Terminator 2. But the big question is, could we make something come to life? Could it be real? So we started some investigating to see if we could do it. And initially, all we did was build things out of bones just to give them an example of how it could move and the dynamism. The first test was he was going to create a herd of rampaging Gallimimus. It was going to look like a Museum of Natural History run amok, with all these skeletons jumping off their steel supports and running through a field, which is all the first test was. But I'll never forget the time that Dennis brought the first test down. I've never seen movements this smooth outside of looking at National Geographic documentaries. Despite the relative crudeness of the earlier tests, it was clear that Phil Tippett's go-motion dinosaurs could be replaced by this breakthrough computer technology. Dennis had kept me informed about all the tests that, that he was doing. I was thinking, you know, holy sh you know, this is it. You know, we're going to be in big trouble now. But I didn't dare call Phil up at that time and say, hey, Phil, we'd like to, you know, replace what you were going to do on the film, you know, you know creating 100 shots with the best go motion ever done in history with CGI. I didn't have the heart to do that then because I wasn't completely convinced until I saw a fleshed dinosaur outside in the worst harsh sunlight. We had our T-Rex walking in a field, just kind of searching. We had the Gallimimus is running, and then we put the two together. Then everyone saw the potential. Now you could see a real physical animal, his skin moving, him breathing, his muscles bulging, all that kind of stuff. When I saw that, and Phil saw that with me for the first time, and there we were watching our future unfolding on the TV screen, so authentic I couldn't believe my eyes. And it blew my mind again. And I turned to Phil, and Phil looked at me, and Phil said, <sighs> he said, I think I'm extinct. And I actually used Phil's line in the movie, gave it to Malcolm to say to Grant when they're walking up the stairs. We're out of a job. Don't you mean extinct? That's what Phil said to me, so I kind of rubbed it in by using it in the film itself. The change was devastating. You know, I had different concessions, building equipment, building puppets, building all this stuff, and all of a sudden it, you know, was, you know, bink, you know, the plug was pulled. Phil, I think, felt very bad that I wanted to go 100% CGI and, and no-go motion at all, which we have no-go motion in Jurassic Park. Um, but I think Phil was able to 
turn himself into the director of the CGI dinosaurs. And eventually, Phil realized there was a place for him, and I was convincing him there is a place for you in your shop on the show. He had some really terrific animators there that understood how we can make these dinosaurs move naturally. He knew so much about dinosaurs and the behavior of animals that he became an animal trainer. He became basically a paleontologist, and he became the Alan Grant of ILM. As the start of filming approached, the final strategy was determined. Phil Tippett's animators would join forces with ILM's computer artists and Stan Winston's robotics team. Together, they would bring Spielberg's vision of living, breathing dinosaurs to the screen. Before any of the computer-generated dinosaurs could be added, Spielberg and editor Michael Kahn had to put the film together. I spent a number of weeks with Mike every single day just, you know, cutting the film down, trimming, making changes. We would show people reacting to something, and i just have to cut the scene as if there were dinosaurs there. Steven would look at the scene with me, and then we'd say, gee, it's great. Now, if, if ILM can do their part, the scene looks great without the dinosaurs. Imagine what it's going to look like with the dinosaurs. And when I was happy with the picture, I locked the print. I literally said, this is a lock, this is the movie. No more changes are done to it, and I turned it over to the post-production group. The beginning of 1993 saw Jurassic Park enter its most crucial stage. It was time to add over 50 CGI shots. This unprecedented task called for the most powerful state-of-the-art computers available. I'm right now in one of our three computer rooms that we have here at ILM. And what we have here are thousands and millions of cycles of computing power going by every single second. They are noisy, they're active, they're hot, and it's up to the people to be able to harness all this energy and all these computing cycles and be able to create images of dinosaurs on the screen. Although the early tests had proven the computer's ability to create dinosaurs, Spielberg now needed more. Jurassic's dinosaurs had to deliver a performance. For the animators, this meant an entirely new level of research and preparation. We wanted to get our heads into that of a dinosaur. We want to learn to think like a dinosaur, because in a sense, our performances are being put into the digital character of the dinosaurs onto the screen. So you have to understand its motivation. It's just like being an actor. When you enter the room, you have to know what you look at first and why, how you hold your body, how you're going to move. To help the animators better understand their dinosaurs, <laughs> Phil Tippett had them step away from their computers. One of my big things is to try and get the animators to, to pantomime with their bodies. So we had instituted these uh, mind classes. Taking those classes helped us be aware of our body and helped us be aware of, of what we were doing and how we were moving and how our foot moves when we take a step. And those are the things that the animator has to think about because those are the things they have to duplicate to get reality. So another interesting thing that we did is because we wanted to make sure that we were really had our heads in the right place, that we were dinosaurs, we used to go outdoors and run around pretending we were gallimimuses or T-Rexes, you know, hunting each other and shoot film. Also to give us an idea of how an animal in motion would look, at least if we were that animal. We were running around with our hands like this, thinking we were gallimimuses, and uh, we watched ourselves and how we move. Because the galleys were bipedal, and humans are bipedal, um, there's a certain amount that you can get from that, watching to see how you shift your weight and things like that. As research continued at ILM, Phil Tippett's Go Motion animators searched for a way to apply their traditional skills to modern computers. We are hands-on guys. We're used to actually walking up to the puppet, uh, making each of these moves by hand. I'm not used to sitting down on a keyboard and having to hit buttons. It's kind of like animating with like boxing gloves on. To bridge this gap between computer animation and movable miniatures, Tippett's shop came up with a unique solution. We proposed the development of this particular piece of hardware, which we nicknamed the dinosaur input device. We take a puppet that's very similar to what they're used to animating and electronically encode it so that they can move this around and have that be applied to a computer. The DID translated actual movement into computer instructions. It eliminated the keyboard while yielding the same CGI results. To ensure that all these results were believable, both sets of animators looked to nature for guidance. Jurassic Park was one of the first films where we could have dinosaurs move as animals. So we poured over animal footage so that we could inject these with believable movements and uh, stay away from third-hand fantasy interpretations, but really go to the um, source, and that was nature. <laughs> to 
to assure a consistent look between the CGI and mechanical dinosaurs, Stan Winston's miniatures, known as maquettes, were sent to the computer artist. And those maquettes were literally put into the computer, so the computer had a design that would configure and wouldn't vary. I didn't want people to say, oh, that's a CGI shot. I wanted to bridge every single technology so the film would simply be, that's a dinosaur, as Grant does when he looks back and he says, it's, it's a dinosaur. Uh -huh. <laughs> Look out! My big responsibility with the whole thing was to get the Rex to run and all the shots. It took me a long time to do. There's no reference for a seven-ton bipedal animal that can move 30 miles an hour. We met with three paleontologists, and they didn't even agree amongst themselves. They're trying to extrapolate from things like footprints and bones and fossil evidence and determine how an animal might move. But when you work from a purely visual standpoint, you sort of have a, a, a whole other way of, of attacking that problem. It took me like two months to try and figure out how to make them run correctly. So we'd, I'd do things like look at them running backwards all the time. Right? You see a lot of mistakes of a creature running backwards. Then we showed them our first film that we liked. And when it was all done, they looked at us and said, you know, that looked pretty dang good, and maybe you guys are right. Hey, 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 hey! Computer technology also made it possible to add important details to affect shots. The splashing water made by the Tyrannosaurus footstep is one such detail. The water was filmed as a separate element. The computer was then able to place the splashing precisely around the dinosaur's foot. Jurassic's animators were creating dinosaurs that looked absolutely real. When you finally see the finished sequence and the pain is all over and all the anxiety that you have is all over and you realize how it all blends together, it's really, it's a thrill. It's what I, as a kid, always wanted to see. I think that's what's coming out. It's a big, neat adventure movie with some really neat looking stuff in it. They didn't match the expectations so much as they matched the, the hope. <laughs> you know, the, the, oh, please, God, please let this you know, all, all work together. Even though I was closely involved with it for such a long period of time, I still watch the film and I go, how did we do this? It was a wonderful collaboration between, you know, effects and artistry and science and paleontology. Every single dinosaur exceeded my expectations. I think the success of Jurassic Park can be attributed simply to the fact that it's about these leviathons of ancient uh, history. It was everything I wanted it to be, you know, no less and a lot more.